Dear colleagues, thank you for attending this online symposium on procedural sedation and thank you to uh, Medronic and the Congress organizers for inviting me as an anesthesiologist to give this short presentation. I'm going to discuss risks and complications uh, of procedural sedation and then some tips and tricks to avoid them. I have conflicts of interest to declare but I uh, do not think they bear any relevance to the lecture of today. First of all, this is the outline of my short presentation and I, let's start with some definitions. I would like to point out to you that uh, recently the Belgian Society of Anesthesiology uh, and the Professional Society of Anesthesiology have uh, produced a document on procedural sedation in Belgium guideline for safe patient care and it was published in the final version of the Acta Anesthesiologica Belgica in 2020. It is not a completely new guideline made by Belgian anesthesiologists but it is a translation of international guidelines uh, to the local Belgian practice um, and they, the document should help clinicians both anesthesiologists and non-anesthesiologists to uh, produce safe patient care. And there is a definition of procedural sedation in the document which I think is an internationally accepted definition. It is the administration of any anxiolytic, sedative, hypnotic, analgesic or dissociative medication to attenuate anxiety, pain, unwanted reflexes, motion during a diagnostic or therapeutic procedure. These agents are administered in order to facilitate amnesia, decrease awareness, improve patient comfort and patient safety. And there are four levels of sedation defined in the document. In some, the, uh, pe people are using five levels of sedation, but basically it's all the same. And these four levels of sedation go from level one, minimal sedation, the patient can spontaneously open the eyes and has just some anxiolysis. Level two, there is moderate sedation and analgesia, but the patient still responds to verbal commands. Deep sedation, the patient reacts only to tactile stimulation. And general anesthesia is the patient does not react to normal stimulation at all. And I think it is also very important to recognize um, the ASA classification because this is crucial in determining which patients can be uh, put under sedation by non-anesthesiologists and which need an anesthesiologist. And of course, I don't have to repeat to you, all of you the ASA classifications. Uh, apologies, this is in Dutch, but it goes from ASA 1, which is a normal healthy person, to ASA 5, which is a dying patient. But especially for ASA 3 and 4, patients with serious systemic disease impairing normal activities or even threatening chronically uh, the life of the patient are the ones that are the high-risk patients and where preferably uh, sedation is performed by a, a, a professional in sedation. What about the complications? Um, I of course could go through many studies but I elected two small studies to just underline uh, the risks of sedation. This is uh, an Italian study, it's about 10 years old, where uh, they were doing monitored anesthesia care or sedation for gastrointestinal uh, endoscopy um, with using uh, normal uh, benzodiazepines uh, or opioids or in some, some uh, propofol. Uh, and what they noted was that um, there is a risk of uh, sedation, and, uh, and I come to that in a moment, but what they also noticed was that the patient population in itself was actually not so bad. The ASA classification was ASA 1 and 2, most of the patients, about 70% of all patients. BMI was not that high, um, and uh, most procedures were planned procedures. So it's actually not a very high risk uh, population, but despite that, the risk of complications is certainly there. Uh, there is a risk of respiratory complications in 1.4%. 
there is a risk of aspiration of gastric contact in 0.1% and there is the risk of cardiac arrest in 0.04%. So with the various drugs, uh, there is that risk uh, around. And you, you can find that many other studies showing uh, similar results, similar risks. So aspiration and respiratory arrest. I, I think we all know that respiratory arrest can be catastrophic, but what I think is underestimated, especially in the gastrointestinal endoscopy world, is the risk of um, aspiration of gastric contents. Uh, and this is a study by, um, I th think it was 2016 or 18, where they looked at proper fall uh, sedation, target controlled infusion sedation. Um, at re relatively low levels and they looked at how many of these patients have an impact on their swallowing and on aspiration and um, the dysphagia severity score normal swallowing to three moderate to severe dysphagia so that is um, not really dysphagia possible um, so it is uh, and what you can see is that in a number of patients uh, um, not huge numbers, but certainly 6% uh, of patients, even with mild sedation levels, TCI of 2 micrograms per milliliter, there is a risk of um, uh, dysphagia. Uh, and uh, there is indeed aspiration possible, uh, even in the low risk group, uh, again 6%, um, and um, uh, in, in, in patients. So aspiration that is not ejected in 6% uh, of patients. So there is that risk if the patient is not uh, well prepared and has an NPO done correctly. So there are these risks and, and I want to focus on the respiratory arrest and on the aspiration problems. Um, and what can we do to prevent them? First of all, I think it is extremely important to make sure that there is good patient selection. Two important things are ASA classification and malampathy. I think you need to select ASA 1 and 2 patients if you perform sedation as a non-anesthesiologist. If it's ASA 3 and 4, preferably you need to seek advice and cooperation of the anesthesiologist. Same for malampathy classification, which is a is a, a score predicting difficulty of the airway management. Um, anything with a malampathy two or three uh, is certainly something we should try and avoid as non anesthesiologist. I think uh, we should also avoid potent drugs like propofol by non anesthesiologists because it, it requires skill and training. And I think we should also avoid combination of drugs or certainly avoid combination of drugs where non, where high doses of the, these drugs are used. Professor Biscops comes to monitoring in a moment, but I think appropriate monitoring, not only measuring saturation, but also respiration is extremely important. And if you perform sedation, I think the sedation should be done by a person at the exclusion of other tasks. So a nurse assisting with the endoscopic procedure, giving the material for the endoscopist, uh, for the biopsies, etc., is not the person that should be doing the sedation. That should be either an anesthesiologist or a nurse doing only that, exclusively the sedation and registration of all parameters. And that person, of course, should be trained and skilled in that. And what we also should do, I think, in any department is register all critical events and incidents and look on an annual basis how often it occurs, in which situations it occurs. To manage these patients, the person managing it should have CPR skills and should have skills in airway management because that are the two most important issues and problems. So I think that is uh, extremely important. So, some take home messages. Despite the fact that many of us think sedation is, is safe, it carries lethal risks. There is the potential of serious complications, one to two percent, uh, even in experienced hands. So we should be pre 
prepared and ready to handle them. I think if non-anesthesiologists would seek to perform um, sedation, we should avoid potent drugs and we should minimize or avoid combination therapy. We should identify high-risk patients and in high-risk patient populations we should ask, seek help of the anesthesiologist. And whomever is doing the sedation, even if it's a nurse, it should always be under the governance and control of anesthesia. Thank you very much for your attention.